Good evening. Um, I know that this is an academic debate, but since my friend Shabir wanted to have a, an exchange on whether the Bible is a book of peace, you're all about to witness the power of the gospel. Any sick person or violent person can convert to some religion and commit violence in the name of that religion. And when sick or violent people adopt an ideology and decide to kill, we don't learn much about the ideology. The serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer, was a cannibal and an atheist, but I don't think we learn much about atheism from Dahmer's cannibalism. Colleen LaRose, a.k.a. Jihad Jane, is an apparently mentally unstable convert to Islam who was arrested for um, plotting to kill the Swedish cartoonist Lars Vilks. I don't think we learn much about Islam from La Rosa's story. Disturbed people doing disturbing things isn't very informative. But there are cases of transformation that deserve special attention. When someone goes from violent to peaceful or from peaceful to violent, we should ask, what caused the change? Over the past few years, I've read numerous stories about confused parents whose sons and daughters have gone off to join terrorist groups. And the parents say over and over again, I don't know what happened. He, he got along with everyone when he was young. He was so friendly. He was so nice. We don't know how he became violent so quickly. Here we should ask what caused the change. Was it the ideology or something else? But the reverse is true as well. When someone wants to kill and then suddenly becomes compassionate or merciful, we should ask what caused the change. Was it the ideology or something else? Now, the world is filled with people who are much, much nicer than I am. But my, I think my experience here is relevant as an introduction to some of the material I'm going to be going into uh, when I address whether the Bible is a book of peace. So I wanted to share a little of my background. Started when I was five years old. I had a raggedy little mutt named Goliath who would attack anything, including bus tires. And one day my mother got a phone call telling me uh, that Goliath had been run over by a bus. And she had to tell me. So she turned to me with tears in her eyes and informed me that my dog was dead. And I, I looked back and my first thought was, so what, it's a dog. And I couldn't figure out why my mom was upset over a dog. As the years went by, people started dying, family and friends, and I always had the same reaction. So what, they're just people, people die every day, why do you care about these ones? Um, years later, many years later, a uh, psychiatrist would give me a piece of paper saying that I'm a sociopath, but I, don't, I, I didn't know any of this back then. I had violent urges as long as I can remember. Usually if someone would annoy me or upset me, I would have just a, an extreme desire to take them out into the woods or something and torture them. But I resisted this urge because I was told you have to resist these kind of, you know, it's like a, you know, a, a smoker who gets on an airplane. You have the urge to smoke, but you're not allowed to smoke, and so just, just keep it to yourself. And so I would keep things to myself. Uh, occasionally I would get called to the school counselor's office, David, why did you draw a picture of you killing all your classmates? Well, it's only a picture. It's not like I'm doing anything, right? As I uh, entered my late teens, I had already figured out that I don't have to listen to what people tell me. I don't have to listen to what society tells me. I can do whatever I want, and that I'd been duped. So I started just doing whatever I felt like doing, sitting beside uh, one of my friends on the couch watching TV one day, and he grabbed the remote control out of my hand, and I just turned and punched him in his face. And uh, I didn't feel bad about it. I felt like I was finally being myself and not, and not holding back. A while after that, I got into an argument with, uh, with my best friend at the time, and uh, I hit him with a shovel and started choking him. And I just remember smiling in his face as his eyes rolled back in his head and bloody foam came out of his mouth. It was Thanksgiving Day of 1994. I hit my dad in the head with a hammer seven or eight times. So I ended up in a couple of jails, a couple of mental hospitals, and a few prisons. It was 1995, and I was in a mental hospital, and it was the day of the O.J. Simpson verdict. And all the crazy people were arguing about O.J. Simpson, and uh, some were saying he, he didn't do it, and so he should go free. Others were saying he did do it, so he should go to prison. And I offered a third option. I, I just blurted out, hey, I, I hope he did do it, and I hope he gets away with it. 
And this guard heard me, and he starts yelling at me, going, that's sick, that's sick. And I couldn't figure out why this guy cared at all about some woman being murdered. A few weeks after that, a few weeks after that, I was uh, talking to one of the administrators there at the hospital, and he was asking me about my views, and uh, he eventually just stopped me and said, very calmly, if you don't see why that's wrong, then they have got you in the right place. This was several months later, and I was in a jail dorm making fun of a Christian named Randy, a guy who turned himself in for 21 felonies. This guy was very interesting. There'd be a fight in the dorm, and he wouldn't watch. He'd turn away and start praying for it to stop this guy made me so mad that I started studying Christianity in order to refute what he was saying. And it was uh, April of the following year that I became a Christian. The moment I became a Christian, ever since then, I've never had any desire to hurt anyone. But I still wasn't a very nice individual, and I considered myself after that, I considered myself a horrible individual because of the things I'd done. A few years went by. And there was a fight in the prison I was at, and I broke up the fight, and I, I dragged one of the guys away to keep them separated. And the next day, uh, I was walking, and the other guy who was in the fight stopped me, and he said, uh, Wood, I don't mean to get in your business, but some of us were wondering what you did to get in here. We're thinking, maybe someone disrespected your girlfriend, and you defended her and hit him too hard, and, and you got locked up for that. But we can't understand how someone like you could ever end up in a place like this. And all of a sudden, I was thinking, wait, you guys think I'm nice? You guys, you guys think I'm good? Just a couple years ago, people were telling me that I'm sick and that I, I need to stay in a mental hospital. And now you guys think that the only reason I could ever get locked up is by defending a woman's honor? It sounded strange. But some sort of change had taken place in that time period. And what's interesting is that this sort of change has been going on for the past 2,000 years in Christianity. The gospel's been having this effect for a long time. When the 12 disciples decided to follow Jesus, they thought that they were taking part in what would eventually become a violent revolution against the Roman Empire. When a group of Samaritans didn't want Jesus to come into their village, James and John said, should we call down fire from heaven upon them? It's, uh, it's not very peaceful, but that shows you the temperament of these, uh, of these guys that were following Jesus. The Apostle Peter, when soldiers came to capture Jesus, Peter swung right from Malchus's head, tried to take his head off. Peter wasn't just trying to protect Jesus there. He believed he was striking the first blow in the final battle between good and evil, not peaceful. But the apostles soon abandoned their violent intentions. In 1 Peter 2.17, the Apostle Peter tells us to honor all people, not some people, all people. What happened to this guy that wanted a bloodbath? The Apostle John, who initially wanted to see his enemies consumed by fire from heaven, declared in 1 John 4, 8, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. It's a big difference. The Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was a Pharisee who believed that uh, Judaism had to be cleansed of all heresies in order for the Messiah to come. So if you wanted violent revolution against the Roman Empire, you had to cleanse Israel spiritually, and that's why he had to exterminate Christianity. If you wanted a violent revolution against the Romans, you had to start with violence against the Christians. After becoming a Christian, Paul wrote to the church in Rome, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. He wrote to the church in Corinth, let all that you do be done in love. He wrote to the church in Ephesus, walk in love. He wrote to the church in Thessalonica, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people. Not some people, all people. What happened to the guy who just wanted a bloodbath again? Now, what changed these men? I would say two things. First, Jesus emphasized love as the core Christian virtue. One day, uh, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, of course, in Mark 12, uh, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But he goes on in Matthew chapter 5, 
to order his followers to love even their enemies. He says, you heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Not surprisingly, Jesus would rebuke his followers when they weren't walking in love. He rebuked James and John for suggesting that they should call down fire from heaven on those who oppose Jesus. When Peter attacked Malchus, Jesus said, put your sword back into its place for those who live by the sword will die by the sword. So he was pointing out that violence just leads to a cycle of violence. Muhammad is actually a perfect example of this. Muhammad was, was poisoned by a woman whose family had, had been ki- uh, whose family had been killed during the invasion of Kaibar. So Jesus followers told uh, Jesus told his followers not to take this path and then by the way he, he healed Malchus, a man who was part of a group that was conspiring to have him crucified. The second thing that changed the apostles was the gospel message itself. When you come to believe that God loves you so much that he entered into creation to pay for what you've done, there isn't much room for hating other people. And I say from experience here, when I came to believe that God loved me in spite of what I had done, what business did I have looking down on anyone else? The Apostle Paul tried to destroy the church, the church, Jesus' church. When God loved him and saved him anyway, how could that man ever look down on the Romans ever again? And that's why he could promote love towards everyone. If you're a Christian here today and you happen to hate someone, if you hate Muslims, I have to ask, are you out of your minds, given what we read? We can see the impact Jesus had on his followers almost immediately. On the cross, Jesus said, about the people who had him crucified and were mocking him, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You can see the impact of this on the first Christian martyr, Stephen, when he's being stoned. And he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. See the the impact? Didn't want them punished. A young man named Saul was there watching the stoning of Stephen. Saul would, of course, become the Apostle Paul. More than 30 years later, as Paul was awaiting his martyrdom, he wrote to his friend Timothy, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. And people wonder how the the members of a church in Charleston can forgive the white supremacists who came in there and opened fire. Why? Where did they get that kind of forgiveness? Is it from a book of violence? One of the earliest Christian writings outside the New Testament is from the early church father, Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome writes about Christians who are actually selling themselves into slavery to give money to the poor. I'll go and quote the passage, chapter 55, verse 2 of 1 Clement. He writes, we know that many among ourselves had delivered themselves into bondage that they might ransom others. Many have sold themselves into slavery and receiving the price paid for themselves have fed others. How did people become so loving that they would willingly sell themselves into slavery to feed the poor? I don't see that very often. For three centuries, Christians endured brutal persecution, and they never fought back. As the Oxford historian Robert Lane Fox writes, During their years of persecution, Christians are not known to have attacked their pagan enemies. They shed no innocent blood except their own. But we know that violence was eventually committed in the name of Christ. So what happened? Well, in the fourth century, the Roman emperor Constantine had a vision. He was praying about an upcoming battle, and he had a vision of a cross with the inscription, conquer by this. And so Constantine concluded in the fourth century that he could conquer with the cross as his symbol. And from that point on, Christianity began merging with the Roman Empire, which had both positive and negative consequences down the road. Negative because the Roman Empire had a Roman Empire kind of way of dealing with things. You crush, you crush your enemies, you don't love them. But the impact of Christianity on the Roman Empire was unmistakable, and moral reform began immediately. I'll give you a couple of examples. When Christians began preaching the gospel, the favorite form of entertainment in the Roman Empire was the gladiatorial games. And people would cheer with glee as slaves and prisoners were forced to cut each other and hack each other to pieces for people's enjoyment. The floor of the Colosseum would 
uh, be just swamped in blood by the end. And one of the favorite spectacles was cutting open one of the bears to see the undigested body parts of humans that were inside it after it had eaten some human beings. And this was the main form of entertainment. Christians were horrified at this violence, and they boycotted the games. Marcus Minucius Felix records a third-century Roman condemnation of the Christian community as follows. You do not attend our shows. You take no part in the processions. You are not present at our public banquets. You abhor the sacred games, the gladiator games. Within a century of Christianity becoming just a legal religion, the gladiatorial games were abolished throughout the Roman Empire. The British historian William Lecky comments, there is scarcely any single reform so important in the moral history of mankind as the suppression of the gladiatorial shows, a feat that must be almost exclusively ascribed to the Christian church. Infanticide, killing unwanted babies or leaving them exposed to die, was extremely common among the Greeks and Romans. Children born frail or with defects would be tossed in a river or left in the woods to die. Unwanted daughters would be tossed in a river or left in the woods to die. Christians condemned this practice in the first century. We read in the first century work that Didache, you shall not murder a child by abortion nor kill that which is born. In the second and third centuries, Christians would, uh, were collecting these abandoned children to care for them. After Christianity was legalized in 374, the Roman Emperor Valentinian, under the influence of uh, Bishop Basil of Caesarea, um, outlawed infanticide and child abandonment. In the first century, it was standard practice for Christian churches to maintain lists of needy people who would be supported by the local church. Over the next few centuries, Christians would often care for orphans in their homes. But when Christianity was finally legalized in the fourth century, Christians invented Orphanages. My father grew up in an orphanage, so he's uh, in the debt of the Christians who invented them. In the same century, Christians invented hospitals. Prior to the spread of Christianity, uh, there, there were places where soldiers could be treated, and there were places for people to go and get a diagnosis. But the idea of a place for the public where people could go in and be cared for when they were sick, that didn't occur to anyone. It occurred to Christians. So if you've ever been treated in a hospital, you're in their debt. Also in the 4th century, Christians invented hospitals for the mentally ill. I suppose I'm in their debt. As the medical historian Fielding Garrison said, the chief glory of medieval medicine was undoubtedly the organization of hospitals and sick nursing, which had its origin in the teachings of Christ. Now, we can go on, and I'm sure we'll go into more detail in the rest of this exchange, but when the impact of the gospel is so glaringly obvious, uh, why are we having this debate? What could Shabir possibly say that would make us think that biblical commands like make every effort to live in peace with everyone or always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people must somehow mean kill people in the name of Christ? Well, if you want to turn the Bible into a book of violence, there are two basic routes you can go. One, you can distort the teachings of Jesus and make them sound more violent. I'll never understand why people who claim to believe in Jesus, distort his teachings, but it happens from time to time. Two, you can point out that there is violence in the Bible. So Joshua fighting the Canaanites, Moses fighting various groups, Saul fighting various groups. There is violence in there. But it seems very odd to say, yes, the final message of the Bible is that Christians are to love everyone and to honor everyone. But you know, there's violence earlier in it, and so it's actually a message of violence. It's especially odd to see our Muslim friends complain about violence in the Old Testament since their prophet claimed that the Torah is the word of Allah. In Sunan Abu Daud, Muhammad told the Jews to bring him a copy of the Torah. When they brought it to him, he said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. So he certainly had a, a high opinion of these scriptures. And of course, in various places in the Quran, we have the, the uh, affirmation of the inspiration, the preservation, and the authority of the Torah. So it's true that there is violence in the Torah, but the Torah is affirmed by both Christianity and Islam. The difference is that according to Christianity, this violence was limited both temporally and geographically, and it came to an end with the gospel, while in Islam the violence continues in a different form. So is the Bible a book of peace, given the final marching orders to love everyone, to honor everyone, to live in peace with everyone, I'd say... Uh, that it's obviously a religion 
a piece in a book of peace. Hello, everybody. Uh, I begin again by praising our creator and fashioner. I ask him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers. I ask him to bless all of you here today. Uh, bless this uh, beautiful city of Chattanooga and bless all of your loved ones, uh, all of us. Uh, I, as we come to the final day of my uh, public performance here in your great city, uh, I want to remark on the, on the fact that everyone I've met here in Chattanooga has been so nice. People at restaurants, people at uh, stores, um, everyone, people at the hotel, and, and of course, uh, my good friend, Bassam. You're, you're all wonderful folks, and I really enjoyed being here uh, with you. So to the business at hand, uh, tonight is the Bible, a, a book of peace. In order to answer that question, I want to go back to the criteria that I established last night to show the connectivity between uh, what we're discussing last night and what we're discussing uh, tonight. So we, we don't do, deal with each book in isolation, but we want to have common principles based on which we can evaluate both books. Otherwise, as I said last night, it's anyone's call. Uh, we don't like a certain thing, so we say we don't like it, and then we invent our own reasons why we don't like that thing. And the thing we like, we, we invent different reasons why we like that thing. But can we come to common ground and, and have common criteria for the two books. This is what I tried to establish uh, yesterday, and you will recall that when I dealt with that topic, I said, is the Quran a book of peace? And I answered that by saying, I'm going to use four criteria. And the first criteria, I said, was how does the book present its heroes? And I showed that the Quran presents its heroes as peaceful individuals. Even the biblical heroes, according to uh, David, as you know, uh, he said that uh, Joshua and David are known for violence in the Old Testament. Well, uh, a lot of violence, tremendous violence, uh, genocide included in, in, in the case of Joshua. But when they are represented in the Quran, they're represented as peaceful individuals or those who are shown to be associated with some violence, uh, the, the total violence that is known from the Old Testament is not repeated in the Quran. So on the whole, the violence is either toned down or eliminated altogether in the Quranic presentation of these heroes. And that's very important, uh, I, I believe, as a criterion. Uh, and the second uh, criterion I said is, does the book command uh, people to live in peace? And I, I've said that there's a verse in the Quran that does that. David disputed that, but, but that's not our question tonight. Our question is, if this is a criterion that I used in looking at the Quran, how will that criterion uh, be applied to the Bible, and how would the Bible fare in, in the face of that criterion? The third criterion, I said, is that, uh, the book should put together a legal system that would allow people to live in peace. We know that you cannot have uh, uh, peace without justice. So do you have a legal system in the book uh, that allows people to... Uh, know their rights and responsibilities so that everything is fair and square between individuals so that people live in peace with justice. And uh, the third is uh, the just war theory that allows for, in the case that war becomes necessary, how do you fight a war? First of all, what are the uh, stipulations before going into a war to be sure that this is a just war to get into? Second, when you're in the war, how do you conduct yourselves in a just uh, manner? And third, at the end of the war, how do you repatriate and make things right, making sure that there's not going to be another war popping up suddenly and that uh, you have achieved the goal for which you set out uh, uh, fighting a war in the first place because you don't go into war without proper goals and now you want to make sure that it's all done. So that's just war theory. And uh, I said last night that uh, in my estimation there's nothing in the Quran that actually goes outside of these parameters of just war theory. And uh, my uh, challenge to David was to find something in the Quran and uh, show that this goes outside of just war uh, theory. And he did mention something, but I don't want to uh, relive that at the moment. If he wants to bring that up again, we'll deal with it, or if we have time, we'll deal with that uh, as, as a separate issue. Uh, but our main topic tonight is what we come to now. Applying these principles, uh, how do we evaluate the Bible. Now, to elaborate on my just war theory, I uh, drew on a book by Professor Darrell Cole from Drury University. H his book is entitled, as you can see, oh, uh, why is it that my um, presentation is not up? Uh, hold on. Um, it should be HDMI, which is there, and laptop, perhaps. Oh, you know what? Because I didn't start it, actually. I just, here. Okay. 
So uh, to go back over very briefly, I started out with this slide, and then I, I moved on. I said, okay, these are my points, but uh, it, you've heard me, and there's nothing more to it than, than what you've heard. But I want to show you this book, and this is where, where we are. So Professor Darrell Cole has written this book. He's a professor at Drury University. He's a committed Christian, and he has given us the just war principles that comes out of the thinking of some great Christian philosophers uh, and saints, starting with St. Ambrose, then we went to St. Augustine and uh, Thomas Aquinas, who said these are the three A's, if you remember. And then he went to also John Calvin, so he said that's the C, so we have three A's and a, and a C for a good report card. Uh, but then it didn't end there. Uh, the, the thinking about just war theory continued into, in the Middle Ages and late Middle Ages into modern times, and uh, the uh, update on that is given by Professor Andrew uh, Wilson uh, in his course book uh, uh, that is uh, entitled The Masters, uh, Masters of War History's uh, Greatest uh, uh, Strategic Thinkers. And uh, so with this idea of just war theory, then, we want to see how does the Bible measure up to, to that uh, if there is a war, how is the war conducted? So that brings us to the question of tonight. After having concluded myself that the Quran is a book of peace, I want to ask the same question about the Bible. Is the Bible a book of peace? So to evaluate that question, rather than put my own bias into the question, uh, let's go and, and use the same criteria, which I think to be fair criteria. Since I've applied that to the Quran, let's do that in the case of the Bible now. So the first cr criterion I want to look at, how does the Bible present it presents its heroes? Uh, David has given us uh, a rosy picture of the Bible talking about love, and, and that's true. And of course, uh, Christians are loving people. And in fact, uh, do you know that the Quran itself acknowledges that Christians are, are people characterized by love? In the 57th chapter of the Quran, the Quran says, uh, And we have placed in the hearts of those who follow Jesus uh, mercy and uh, compassion. Ra'fa. Uh, 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 could be uh, love and, and mercy and also compassion, the next word that is there in, in Arabic. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Bassam, or those of you who know Arabic here. Uh, so the Quran is acknowledging that Christians are great people. Uh, they, they are loving individuals. They're characterized by kindness and all of that. So all of the history that uh, David has charted from the first century going through the later centuries of Christians setting up hospitals and, and so on, uh, feeding people, taking care of the orphans, all of this is acknowledged. There's no dispute there. Uh, now, oh, how does the book itself measure up because it, it is possible that Christians are good people not because of the book itself or maybe because of some parts of the book. Maybe they follow some parts of the book and ignore some other parts. We know uh, in, in logic that there is the fallacy uh, of, that fallacies related to causation. Uh, so people instead of identifying uh, the, the whole host of causes, they identify just simply one cause. Um, so we need to find out the whole host of causes, like what caused pe Christian people uh, to be uh, as, as they are. So one cause is, yes, they have read passages in the Bible. For example, God is love, First John chapter 4, verse 8. Now, uh, when, when we ask, is that the only teaching in the Bible, the answer uh, may be different. Um, so what about the heroes? How are the heroes presented? Now, it's often said that, uh, you know, these people we're talking about, Joshua and David and so on, they're all from the Old Testament, right? So what about the New Testament? The New Testament supposedly presents a new picture. However, in the book of Hebrews, uh, a number of persons are given uh, as the great heroes who were so great that the world is not fit to, to bear them. And among these persons are David and and. Uh, and others who, according to the book of Hebrews, what characterizes them as being great? They were conquerors. They were conquerors. And I thought David had a problem with uh, Muhammad being a conqueror. Uh, and whether Muhammad was or not, that's a separate question. But uh, if David has a problem with Muhammad being a conqueror, then how does this New Testament uh, uh, praise some people who were conquerors? So we have to get the whole list. And we can go to Hebrews chapter 11 and, and see that whole list uh, uh, before us. So we, we want to go to Hebrews. I'm in Hebrews chapter 1, go for, going forward to chapter 11. Uh, 
it's most embarrassing when you're looking for something and you can't find it. You know, and you thought it's there. So in Hebrews chapter 11, starting with uh, verse number 12, what more shall I say? I have not time to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, uh, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by their faith conquered kingdoms. And so on, until he goes to say that the, the, the earth was not uh, fit to, to, to carry these uh, persons. So, uh, I don't know that much about Gideon, um, and I don't know anything about Barak, except that there's a Barak in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> but what about Samson? I remarked last night that, that Samson uh, killed himself and a whole host of people in the arena. Now, uh, you might say these were bad people. But do Christians kill bad people? Uh, does the New Testament teach us to kill bad people? Well, it seems that in this part, uh, the, the New Testament is celebrating uh, the, the life and glory of a person who is known to be a mass killer. Uh, and and I, I say this with hesitation. I mean, I, David is right. Uh, Muslims have to respect the Bible. And it is true that the Quran says uh, that uh, the, the Torah has in it uh, revelation from God. And Muslims believe that. We're not denying that. Now, for the, for the Muslim, they, the, the trouble is that there would be revelation also in these uh, ancient books, but also those revelations are mixed with other things that people have put in there. So the Muslim needs to distinguish between the, the two. Uh, another verse of the Quran, which David did mention, is uh, the second chapter of the Quran, the 79th uh, verse, which says, uh, Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say it is from God in order to profit uh, thereby but a little. Uh, so uh, from this passage, Muslims generally understand that previous scriptures were corrupted by human individuals. And you might be saying, okay, the Quran is saying that, that's, uh, that's a Muslim book, we don't have to worry about a Muslim book. But in fact, uh, the Bible also shows that uh, the Torah has been corrupted. Where? In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse number 8. Jeremiah, the prophet, is saying, how can you say we are wise and we have the Torah of the Lord, whereas the lying pens of the scribes have falsified it. Now, the translations in various uh, books may be different, but that's the basic idea. Jeremiah is saying that the Torah, as they have them at that time, uh, as they have it at that time, is, has been corrupted by the pens of the, of the scribes. So now, for a Muslim, uh, when we read the stories about David and so on, we're saying David was a great prophet of God. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. How could Muslims accept that, that a man like this uh, committed some of the atrocities that are mentioned of him in the, in the Old Testament. So, so we don't think he did. Uh, one of the things that's, that's mentioned about David is that he wanted to marry Michal, the, Saul's daughter. And uh, Saul basically said to him, well, you want to marry Michal? Great, but you have to bring me 200 Philistine foreskins. Now, so the Israelites and the Philistines are always at loggerheads with each other, and Samson was uh, usually going out and killing some Philistines and coming back. Uh, you know, he's the hero of, of the Israelites. Now, David is the hero of, of the Israelites, so to get married, he has to bring 200 Philistine foreskins. Now, how do you get 200 Philistine foreskins? You have to sculpt the men, right? Sculpt. Uh, so, it, obviously, we'd have to kill them first and then sculpt them in the right place and then bring back the proof that he has killed them. Then he gets the girl. Uh, none of this is mentioned in, in, the, in the Quran. Uh, what about uh, Jephthah? Jephthah actually uh, killed his, his daughter uh, after having um, uh, vowed to, to do so. And then God apparently fulfilled uh, what he wanted, and so he had to carry out the, the vow. And uh, it is interesting that the Quran actually prevents people from killing their infants. Uh, uh, David was citing uh, a Christian scholar who uh, said that, uh, you know, killing infants is wrong. Um, so it would be nice to have a verse of the Bible which say, says killing infants is wrong. And there, and there is actually a verse as well uh, about sacrificing your children to the gods. Uh, but uh, the Quran itself uh, prohibits people from killing their, their infants because at the time when the Quran was revealed, uh, girls were being buried alive, we, we learned from uh, some of the early sources. Uh, so uh, we go on to David. I mentioned David. That uh, Samuel. Uh, Samuel was receiving revelations from God. And his revelations were, were telling Saul that he had to go out and kill some more because Saul was basically commanded to kill off the Amalekites. And, uh, and he didn't kill them all off. So he spared some and some animals. And Samuel's message to, 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 Samuel's message to Saul was, God spoke to me and told me 
Man, you've got to go out and kill some more. You've got to kill them all off. So why kill them all off? Where does this idea come from? In the Old Testament, there's this idea of harem, harem, which is related to the Arabic court word haram. So there, there's a total ban put on a town, but it's not only on one town. There are, are many places. Uh, God said to, uh, to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. And uh, within that land that God is giving them, Everything that breathes has to be eliminated. So several people are named. The Hivites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Amorites. Uh, I can't even remember all of the names. Uh, the Canaanites and, and, and the Amalekites. Uh, so Saul's problem was that he took pity on some of them. He didn't kill them all. Uh, now, in Deuteronomy, uh, one of the books of the Torah, uh, details what's to be done. You uh, get into this, uh, you get into the, if, if you're dealing with a place that God has given you as your possession, the Israelites are given possession of that place, then they kill everything that breathes. But if they go to another place where outside of the range of which God has given them to possess, that means apart from what God has given them, they may have other conquering amb ambitions. If they go to this other place, then they should offer terms of peace. And if the people surrender under terms of peace, there is a way of dealing with them. Uh, but in the land in which God has given you, you, you kill everything that, that breathes. And so Saul uh, did not fulfill the commandment, and uh, that was uh, the, the problem there. So uh, the New Testament is the proving of, the, of these great heroes. Uh, so, so that's my question. How does the book present its uh, heroes? That's my first criterion. The second cr criterion is, is there a command in the Bible that says you should live in peace? And... Uh, uh, I, I'm sure there is. I haven't studied it in, in that great detail, and I'm sure that uh, David will have verses lined up that deal with that. Uh, there are many parts of the Bible that actually are very peaceful, and when we acknowledge that. So I'm going to move on from that criteria, and I, I will say, put a star there. The Bible uh, it has flying colors right there. Uh, three, what about a legal system? About a legal system uh, to le let people live in peace. Now, we've already seen that the Old Testament actually does not have a universal legal system that will allow everybody to live in peace. In fact, sometimes people, uh, like David will say, oh, but now we have the New Testament, everybody can love each other, and so on. What about the people in Palestine? That, the people in Palestine live in part of the land which the Israelites think has been given to them. They have the title deed. Is the title deed a book from God? So this book says that they own all of that land, and the Palestinians do not have a right to live there. So Jews are coming in from other parts of the world, flocking into Jerusalem because they think that they should be there, and the Palestinians are being shoved off uh, of of the, the more lucrative parts of, of the land. So even uh, international de uh, decrees are defied by those who think we don't have to follow the international decrees. We can go set up our residence on the Palestinian land because it's not really Palestinian land. This land is our land, God told us. So these commandments in the Bible actually do have repercussions for peace in our present times. It is not a, a, a complete system of justice that will allow people to live in peace. Now, does the New Testament change that? No, actually no, because the New Testament uh, reaffirms the right of the Israelites. Uh, the, the New Testament basically says, well, Christians are the new Israel, uh, but there is ambiguity in the, in the New Testament with uh, Paul, for example, saying that God's promise is irrevocable. So you give a promise to the Israelites, that promise is irrevocable. Uh, so... The Israelites do own that land, according to the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament. Today, there is a pro proposal that perhaps there can be pe a peaceful settlement between Palestinians and, and Israelites. Let's uh, have a two-state solution and divide uh, uh, Jerusalem. We take e East Jerusalem, you take West Jerusalem. Some say no. Why? Because God gave them Jerusalem. And the New Testament affirms that, that Jerusalem uh, is is. Uh, has that status, even all the way down to the book of Revelation, which uh, I like um, uh, David's statement, the marching orders. What, how does the book end? The book ends with uh, Revelation reaffirming all of these things. Now, the just war theory. Does the, the book give you a just war theory? And in fact, uh, no, we, we cannot approve of genocide. No just war theory is going to approve of genocide and ethnic cleansing. And yet we see that being done in the Bible again and again over and over. Finally, I want to say something about the book of Revelation, because it's all this about, uh, you know, God is love and so on. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. It sounds nice. But then the book of Revelation shows that when Jesus comes back, he will actually kill off the people 
who were his enemies. So he will persecute his enemies rather than pray for them. Moreover, there are indications in the uh, book of Revelation that his faithful followers will be caught up into heaven with him uh, in the great rapture, and then they will come back with him to fight in his great army to do what? To decimate the population. And it is interesting in the, that in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 63, God is shown with his clothes bloodied after he has like stepped over the dead bodies of his, uh, of his enemies. And now Jesus in the book of Revelation is shown like father, like son. He comes back with a sword coming out of his mouth. He kills his enemies. His uh, uh, garment is also uh, red with the blood of his enemies. And when we debated a, a few weeks, uh, a week or so ago in uh, Detroit, David quoted for me a, a passage from the Psalm, Psalm 110, showing that uh, God is saying to Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is going to be sitting on a throne, and what is his foot going to rest on? The slain bodies of his enemies. And uh, in, there is the undercurrent in the New Testament thinking that Jesus should be that victorious conqueror. So we have both. It is both a book of love and also a book of war and dreadful violence. Thank you. In my opening statement, I drew attention to the impact the Bible had on the early Christians and on the generations that followed. Before their transformation, Jesus' apostles wanted violent revolution. After their transformation, they wanted revolutionary love. Some of the early Christians took this revolution to such an extreme that they started selling themselves into slavery in order to feed the poor. Within a century of becoming a, a legal religion, Christians had outlawed infanticide and the gladiatorial games, and they had invented orphanages, hospitals, and mental hospitals. And that's the impact of the gospel, and Shabir didn't dispute uh, most of this. But according to Shabir, the Bible is not a book of peace. He says we need criteria for judging a book of peace, and I agree that we need criteria. I happen to reject most of his criteria um, as something that would decide whether uh, a book is a book of peace. Uh, my criteria are much simpler. If the final marching orders of the book are to love everyone, to live in peace with everyone, I would say it's a book of peace. If the final marching orders of the book are violently subjugate unbelievers, I would say it's not a book of peace. But Shabir has other criteria. He says, how does a book present its heroes and role models? As I pointed out, uh, last night, Muhammad is presented as a role model who called for fighting unbelievers simply for being unbelievers, for only showing mercy towards one's fellow Muslims and never towards unbelievers and so on. Uh, but if we're talking about biblical figures, Shabir has a couple of complaints that um, I wouldn't take very seriously and some that I would, and so I'm going to focus on uh, those. But as far as the ones that I wouldn't take very seriously... Um, Samson, when he's captured, he's a prisoner of war, and the people gather together to mock him and to mock Israel's God, and this is in the context of war, and he pushes down the pillars, and it brings down the people who are gathered together in the context of war. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that would make the Bible a, a book of peace. Um, David, during a context of war, being sent out to kill Philistines and bring back proof of how many he had killed, uh, this is a context of war. Uh, Jephthah uh, killing his daughter, I wouldn't consider this much of anything. The, the judges in the book of Judges are not great moral figures, and they're not presented as such. I mean, Samson's running around with a prostitute. Jephthah uh, makes a hasty vow and then keeps the vow, nothing, uh, nothing involving God as affirming what he did. Now, Shabir's, uh, Shabir says that I condemn Muhammad for conquering, and so why don't I condemn these other people for conquering? Well, I don't condemn con uh, Muhammad for conquering. Um, I would have a lot to say about him fighting unbelievers simply for being unbelievers, fighting and subjugating Jews and Christians for being Jews and Christians. I have a lot to say about that. But even there, just to clarify in case anyone is confused, my objection to Islam is not that it promotes, even that it promotes violence towards unbelievers. My objection to Islam is that it's not true. I say that it promotes violence towards unbelievers because people keep saying that it doesn't, and the media keeps saying, keeps saying that it doesn't, and politicians keep saying that it doesn't. If we could get past that and look at what Islam actually teaches, we could then ask the question whether it's true or not. Now, so the issues that would be more important would be what Shabir has called genocide. And yesterday he said, I called it genocide. I don't call it genocide. Uh, and there's actually a problem here. There's actually a problem here with Shabir's interpretation of these texts. Now, Shabir says that these passages in the Old Testament are calling for, for genocide. And I will grant that if you read the passage without the surrounding text, 
that you might come to that conclusion because that's what it sounds like it's calling for. It sounds like it's saying completely wipe everyone out, completely destroy everyone. That's what the text sounds like it's saying. If you read the rest of the text, you will see it can't possibly mean that. I don't mean I'm interpreting it differently. I mean it can't possibly mean what Shabir says it means. So these texts that call, it, he pointed to um, texts in Deuteronomy, for instance, which call for um, completely wiping people out. Side by side with these texts, in fact, far more common are commands to drive them out and claims that God will drive them out before you. Now, how are these two reconcilable? One, think of the two commands. One, go and wipe everyone out. Leave alive, no, leave alive nothing that breathes. And in the same text, you would find drive them out before you. What's going on there? We would look at those as complete contradictions, not in the ancient Near East. So let me give you an example. In Exodus 23, 23, God says to the Israelites, my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. So they're going to be completely destroyed, right? They're destroyed and there's going to be nothing left, according to that text. Later, in the same chapter, God explains what he means. I will not drive them out before you in a single year, that, you may, uh, that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. So what's going on here? God says he's going to drive them out little by little, and yet he says he's going to destroy them. Those sound like completely different things to us. Not in the ancient Near East. I'll give you another example of the problem here. All the groups that are said to be destroyed appear later on in the text. If they're destroyed, if they're wiped out, if nothing has been left alive, how do these groups all appear later in the text? So, for instance, in the, so we have the commands to go and slaughter everyone in the book of Deuteronomy and Exodus and so on, side by side with passages saying that God's going to drive them out. And then in the book of Joshua, Joshua goes city by city, and it says that he completely does what the Lord says. He completely wipes them out, nothing left alive. And then we have everything summed up for us in Joshua 11:23. So Joshua took the entire land just as the, Lord, just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal divisions, and the land had rest from war. So everything's done. Joshua had done what God commanded him. That would mean wipe everything out, if that's what the text means, right? Why do we read in the very next book, first verse, after the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who of us is to go up first to fight against the Canaanites? I thought Joshua had already wiped out the Canaanites in accordance with everything the Lord commanded him. And then the first verse, right after his death, who's going to fight the Canaanites for us? This should be telling you something is going on. They're using language in a way that we don't. If drive people out of the land is used side by side with utterly destroy them, that should be the first clue. And when the groups that are said to be killed and destroyed are around later in the text, that should be the second clue. And we find the same thing with the issue of the Amalekites. So here's a passage. Saul is ordered, 1 Samuel 15, 3, Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both men and women, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So kill everything, right? And then it says, Saul did it, except he kept the king alive. So everyone is dead. All the Amalekites are dead except the king. And then Samuel kills the king. So now there are no more Amalekites, if that's what the text means. Later in the same book, 1 Samuel 27, 8 to 9. Now David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites. How are the Amalekites there? They were supposedly completely exterminated. The Amalekites show up again in 1 Samuel 30. Centuries later, they're still there during the reign of Hezekiah in 1 Chronicles 4. Still more centuries later, the main enemy of the Jews in the book of Esther is Haman, a descendant of King Agag, the king who was supposedly the last living Amalekite. What's going on with the text? Well, we happen to know exactly what's going on with the text because we can compare it with other ancient Near Eastern sources. And when we do that, we find that this is a literary device. If you conquered, so if you conquered someone else's army, you use bragging rights of complete annihilation of them. This was meant to intimidate. This was meant to boast and brag about your God and so on. And it's a common literary device. 
We do something slightly similar. If your football team wins, you describe, you don't say, we scored way more points than them. You say, we massacred them, we slaughtered them, we butchered them, and you didn't do any of that literally. That's how we talk. They just took it to another level. And notice, it has to be like, it has to be that, unless you think the authors are completely insane and that they don't realize, hey, once I've said in my text that this group has been completely exterminated, I obviously can't have them showing up later in the text. So they're either, ex they're either insane or they're using a literary device, but we know it's a literary device. Zaini Zevit, professor of biblical literature at Northwestern uh, and Northwestern Semitic languages, says when the composition and rhetoric of the Joshua narratives in chapters 9 through 12 are compared to the conventions of writing and conquest in Egyptian, Hittite, Akkadian, Moabite, and Aramaic texts, they're revealed to be very similar. And we find this from many others. We know what's going on here. It's called hagiographic hyperbole. You don't say, I beat them. You say, I completely slaughtered them and left nothing left alive. So there is violence. There is an invasion. There is fighting. But it's not the genocide that Shabir calls for. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there later in the text. Shabir's second criterion. Does the book command people to live in peace? He said it probably does. I'll go ahead and make it certain for him. Since he quoted the book of Hebrews, talking about the heroes it puts forward and saying this puts forward heroes of violence, I'll quote Hebrews 12.14, says that Christians are to pursue peace with all men. Again, not some men, all men. Third, does the book give a legal system to govern life? Well, Christianity isn't about establishing a legal system. Jesus said his kingdom is not a kingdom of this world. He said if it were, his, fo his followers would be fighting to rescue him, but his kingdom is not of this world. As a general rule, if you take to heart, love your neighbor as yourself, that's going to work in a variety of contexts, uh, regardless of the form of government. Now, Shabir complains about the Bible because he says that the Jews claim that the Bible gives them the right to the land, and so since the Bible claims that Jews have right to the land, well, th this is never going to allow peace. Uh, let me read a verse of the Quran here, chapter 5, verse 32. Allah says, For this reason did we prescribe to the children of Israel that whoever slays a soul, unless it be for manslaughter or for mischief in the land, it is as though he slew all men. Is it, this, it says he revealed to the children of Israel. If anyone makes mischief in the land, what, what, what land would that be? Is it A, China, B, Chattanooga, or C, Israel. The Quran says God gave them the, the authority to carry out Jewish law in the land of Israel. So if he has a problem with that in the Bible, well, he just once again condemned his own text. And finally, Shabir says, if war becomes necessary, are the book's teachings consistent with just war theory? Now, it's simply amazing that Shabir is appealing to just war theory as developed by Christians in order to condemn the book that led to just war theory. There were some earlier writers, such as Cicero and so on, who, t who gave some principles of just war theory, but the, the full-fledged just war theory comes because Christians were in the Roman Empire, and again, the Roman Empire still had a Roman way of doing things, and Christians wanted to make sure that they could reconcile the, the uh, passage in Romans 13, which says that governments are instituted to punish wrongdoers, but to keep those consistent with Christian principles of loving your neighbor as yourself and loving your enemies. And so these were harmonized in just war theory that, yes, there are times when war is necessary for the state, but that you need to do everything you can uh, to keep it in line with these principles. And Shabir appeals to this to, to then condemn the book that gave rise to it. So he's kind of indirectly there admitting that it's the Bible that produced this, and therefore the Bible is a book of peace. You guys hear me? All right. So uh, that was very interesting, David. I'm glad that you finally um, uh, engaged with uh, the, the criteria that I presented. So I want to see what uh, David has to say about these criteria. Uh, first, uh, about the heroes. Uh, David is saying, well... Uh, uh, it's, we won't take Samson seriously because uh, he was operating within a context of, of war. He was a prisoner of war. Uh, yet, uh, when I went to Sunday school and we colored uh, drawings of Samson, we came away thinking this is the great hero with that, you know, here, if it get, gets cut off by Delilah, then he's rendered powerless. So, want to be a hero like, like Samson. The, the question is, how does the book present its uh, heroes? Uh, David, I took an in interest in slingshots when, when I knew the story of David, but the story didn't end with the slingshot. The slingshot and the Bible only knocked Goliath out. The, the rest of the story is that David went and cut off his head. So 
uh, the, the violence, this, you know, goes on and on. But in the Quran, uh, we just have a simple statement, بَقَتَلَ دَعُودُ جَعْلُوتَ David killed Goliath. That's the end of the story. It doesn't say anything more. None of that bloody detail. Um, uh, Jephthah. Okay, I'll, I'll give up Jephthah. I've, I'm even sorry that I even mentioned it. But I just mentioned it because it came in the sequence here. Because that doesn't have violence. Uh, it doesn't have repercussions for violence in society, unless, unless you're thinking that, you know, maybe somebody uh, is dealing with a, a child, thinking the child is possessed by the devil, or, and, you know, it can have repercussions, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that one alone. Forget about Jephthah. Um, so, David, you scored a point. Uh, <laughs> Now, he's saying that he, he does not condemn uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for conquering. Uh, but uh, let, let's think about what he's actually condemning the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for, and how that compares with these heroes uh, of, the, of the Bible. Uh, David says that the final marching orders in the Quran, which Muhammad is giving, or which Muhammad is, is, is reveal, uh, re, uh, or receiving by revelation, according to Muslims, that these uh, en enjoin uh, violence against uh, non-Muslims because they are non-Muslims. And I've, as I pointed out yesterday, Sherman Jackson, in his article, Jihad in the Modern World, has explained, with reference to Fred Donner, that in that, in that context, uh, in, in 7th century Arabia, it, it's different from now. Like, nowadays, you sit... Uh, safely thinking that nobody's going to attack your country. Why? Uh, first of all, because America is a great and powerful nation. You don't expect that somebody's going to attack you. But second, countries don't generally attack each other nowadays because they all are subscribing to certain international conventions that says we're not going to attack each other. So we can all sleep at, in peace at night. Uh, but in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as Fred Donner has pointed out, the general idea was that people are at a state of war unless they have entered into a specific covenant. And uh, the, with that idea in mind, uh, the question is then, who did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, enter into covenants with? And as long as people have entered into co covenants with him, he would not attack him, and he does not expect them to attack uh, uh, he would not attack, attack them, and he would not expect them to attack him. So it is in that context that when we look at the Quran, we see, for example, what Sir David is citing as final marching orders comes in the ninth chapter of the Quran. Uh, the 29th verse he has cited to show that Muslims uh, are somehow going to fight against Jews and Christians in general, but that's not what the verse says, literally. If you take the verse literally, the verse is saying uh, that uh, you should fight against those from among the people of the book, who could be Jews, Christians, and others as well, those from among the people of the book who do not believe in God. Now, uh, we have some Christians in this room here. We have some Christians in this room. Okay, if you don't believe in God uh, and you're a Christian, just raise your hand. Okay, that means there's nobody in this room to whom that verse applies. Because that verse is saying, fight against those people of the book who do not believe in God and do not and so on. So there are a number of criteria. So for somebody to meet all of those criteria and to follow the verse literally, it just would not apply. Now, David might say, well, okay, in that case, the verse is meaningless. Uh, and, and then I can say, well, if the verse is meaningless, you can't say that this verse is commanding you to do something if you don't know what the verse is commanding you to do. So now let's say ISIS is trying to recruit a young Muslim and saying, come join our forces and, and let's go kill some people. And the young man says, okay, well, uh, who said we should kill these people? And, and ISIS says, God says. So the young man says, well, show me the verse where it says God says. And then the verse doesn't actually say that. So the ISIS may say, well, that's our interpretation. Well, okay, say it's your interpretation. Uh, so the, the same book might be interpreted by somebody peacefully and somebody else violently. But is your violent interpretation coming right out of the book or are you putting it into the book? In this case, it's clear that they're putting it into the book. And David is going along with those Muslim scholars who have actually read it that way. They did read it in a violent way. And so David is right in that sense in that he is relying on some Muslim scholars. But as we've seen last night, David has his own agenda. He's not relying on the Muslim scholars like a Muslim relies on the Muslim scholar. The Muslim is relying on a Muslim scholar because the average Muslim doesn't know better, doesn't know the Arabic, doesn't know the history, doesn't know how Quranic interpretation has been done. And the average Muslim is going to follow those sacred books which they know from, from, the, from ancient history. Uh, in fact, I... I'm sorry, I said sacred because they're not sacred books. The, the commentaries by Muslim scholars are, are not sacred. They, they could be right, they could be wrong, and we know that as a matter of principle. Uh, but the average Muslim may even treat them as sacred. Yeah, these are great scholars. Yeah, how can you say anything critical of them? They must be right. Uh, and who are you with a newfangled doctrine? Maybe you, because you live in Canada, maybe because you were educated in a modern Western secular university. That's why you have these ideas. But I say go back to the text. Well, we all know Arabic. The modern standard Arabic is basically similar to the Quranic Arabic. 
Arabic has remained standard throughout the ages, fairly so, even though all languages evolved, so too does Arabic. And we can go back to the classical commentaries and see how did they reach that interpretation. Now, if you do this for yourself, go to an English translation of that verse, chapter 9, verse number 29, and you will see that they all have to put something in brackets to make it mean what they want it to mean. So Muslims should fight against Jews and Christians, all Jews and Christians. How do they do that? By putting things in brackets. But the verse itself says only those Jews and Christians who do not believe in God and do not believe in the life hereafter, which the Quran calls the last day, and so on. So to find such a, maybe nowadays you might find some Christians who, uh, they say they're Christians, but they don't actually believe in God. Uh, that, that's, I know that. But you know, if you think of 7th century Arabia, people were not affected by modern uh, theories about uh, the existence of God and so on, so, or the non-existence of God. So then, uh, what we find is that David is actually distorting uh, the Muslim scripture, and he's not the first to do it. Uh, Muslim scholars have done it before, uh, for good reason, and with good intentions. And uh, the uh, violent extremists today are, are, are banking on that misinterpretation. And David is celebrating that misinterpretation because, as he admitted here last night, he is happy when, like ISIS, uh, commits atrocities against people because that helps his evangelizing mission. Actually, he said that. Didn't he say this? Dave, David actually said this. David actually said this. I'll, I'll read you. I actually transcribed in my own hand uh, what, he, what he said. I didn't think it would become necessary, but I was just interested. At, uh, if you go to the recording of what David said last night, at exactly one uh, hour, 31 seconds, and 38, uh, one, one hour, 38 minutes, and 38 seconds, this is what David said. He said, he said, and he's referring to me, so he, Shabir, said, I'm inserting Shabir, he, Shabir, said that I actually like ISIS killing people because I can use that to win converts. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here. I love it when ISIS goes around raping their captives and chopping people's heads off and crucifying them and blowing their brains out because I think that will really help me in my ministry work. I, 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 I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I don't think so. Um, so continue then. To continue then, this is a distortion. Now, he says he wouldn't call these acts of violence genocide. Why wouldn't he call them genocide? It's wiping out the whole people. Now, he says because this is a literary device, uh, it didn't really mean genocide. It, it's just talking about wiping them out like we say we wiped out somebody in a hockey game. The only thing is that at the end of the hockey game, there's only a little bit of blood from somebody's uh, uh, lips being uh, uh, hit. Uh, but what we find is that actual numbers of people and, and very graphic descriptions. When we say, you know, we sing round and round the walls of Jericho, but the rest of the story is that it says actually that Joshua went in there and killed everything that breathes. So maybe there's an exaggeration, but it is still the basic idea is that there's a vast amount of killing going on here. And uh, what he has cited actually is the fact that the Bible does contradict itself. There are various writers. So somebody wrote the book of Joshua, somebody else wrote Judges, and they have different ideas. So even though in the book of Joshua it's saying that everybody has been killed off, it, these people pop up again by a different writer because a different writer has a different idea. I said last night, that I don't blame Joshua for this. I don't think Joshua is being properly represented in these books. These are not historical. I agree with that uh, study. That shows that these are not really historical. Yes, there is evidence that people survived. But this, what he's calling a literary device, is, is, is the, uh, pointing to the fact that the text literally says that, that Joshua wiped out uh, these people. So it is uh, genocide. Uh, city by city, one after another. What about 1 Samuel chapter 15? Yes, uh, so when you come down, everybody killed off except the one king, and then uh, Samuel comes and kills the king. So it, it is, like, very specific. People are being killed. It's not just a literary uh, device. What about uh, the uh, legal system? Well, if we, if we see what is the system... In Deuteronomy uh, chapter number uh, 20, uh, there are instructions specific. What do you do with the cities that you, you attack? You lay siege to them. If they uh, 
if they agree to be subjected to you, you force them into labor. If they refuse, you do battle with them, you lay siege to them. And then when God delivers them into your power, you put every male to the sword. And then the women and the children you keep for yourselves. Uh, and then what about the cities in the area which God has given you? then you kill everything that, that breathes. This is very specific. It's not uh, just a literary device. Uh, it's not that I am misrepresenting or misunderstanding the Bible. Scholars of Christianity uh, uh, struggle with the same thing. Uh, Show Them No Mercy is a book uh, co-authored by uh, some Christian evangelical scholars. They're admitting as a fact that this genocide take pl take took place. They're now asking, what do we do with that? How do we understand it? in reference to the New Testament. So they're not disputing the fact. Now, finally, uh, laying down the sword by Philip Jenkins, on page number 13, this is what he has to say. If the founding text shapes the whole religion, then Judaism and Christianity deserve the utmost condemnation as religions of savagery. Of course, they are no such thing, nor is Islam. I respect Judaism, I respect Christianity, I respect the Bible. Uh, I, I didn't say that the Bible is not a book of peace. I, David misquoted me when he said that. I, I said to you, and you heard me, that it is peaceful and also violent. Take it the way you like. Thank you. Thank you, Shabir. Now, Shabir went back to his uh, first criterion, how does a book present its heroes and role models? He said in Sunday school, Samson and David are presented as heroes. Uh, according to the Bible, Samson's a dirtbag, right? I mean, l let's face it. This guy's going around, messing around. With this guy's doing everything he's not supposed to do uh, as a follower of God. The point of these stories, because uh, Muslims don't exactly have the same thing in Islam, the point of the stories about God taking horrible sinners and doing something with them is a consistent theme throughout Scripture. It's Jesus who is the one who is perfect. And Muslims have this idea that prophets are sinless or something like this. It doesn't come from the Quran. That doesn't come from the Quran itself. That's a, a Muslim myth that developed over time. Uh, but so, so Samson is, is, you would lift him up for, for doing something in spite of his massive failures. David is actually described as a man over, uh, after God's own heart. But the things David did that were wrong, like the affair with Bathsheba and so on, he's condemned for that and judged for it and suffers for the rest of his life for it. So it's not saying be like David in every way. David is portrayed as a sinner who is nevertheless used by God in a mighty way. Now, Shabir asks, well, what do I condemn Muhammad for if I'm not condemning him for conquering? He says that Fred Donner says <laughs> that in that context, you were at war uh, unless there was some sort of agreement. You're, you're just at war with everyone. Um, let's look at the text Shabir quotes, because Shabir quoted Surah 929, and apparently this is talking about atheist Christians and Jews, those who don't actually believe in God. Let's read the verse. Fight those, chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran, fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger. So if you don't forbid the same things that Muslims forbid, if you eat pork and Islam forbids pork, you don't forbid the same things, therefore this applies to you. Nor acknowledge the religion of truth. What's the religion of truth? Islam, right, according to this text. You Christians, you acknowledge Islam as the religion of truth? Well, what's it say? Fight those who, and then it gives this list of criteria for fighting you nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, if Shabir's interpre interpretation is correct, Muhammad sure didn't know it because Muhammad launched an offensive attack against the Roman Christians, and I'm pretty sure they believed in God. Now, it's, it's ironic that Shabir condemns me for distorting the meaning of the text, even though he acknowledges there are many Muslim uh, scholars who would agree with me. But given the distortion of, of my sarcasm here, Shabir, if you've, if you've never encountered sarcasm, <laughs> it's a lovely Western concept. <laughs> now, Shabir says that, um, well, why wouldn't I call it genocide? Joshua took Jericho. Jericho is another perfect example, right? So we read the story of Joshua taking Jericho, right? Remember I talked about hi, uh, hagiographic hyperbole. If you conquered and defeated your enemy, you, you got these massive boasting rights as a mean of taunting others and so on. And this was, again, a standard literary device of the time. Uh, it wasn't considered deceptive. People of that time would have understand what you, exactly what you're doing. The, the Egyptians did it. The Hittites did it. The Moabites did it. Israel would have been odd if they didn't do it. And so this is what we find in Scripture, but, but the, the, uh, Joshua taking Jericho is a perfect example. 
because what we know from archaeology is that Jericho was not a, a civilian town. It was a military outpost. It might have had some sort of inn or something like that, but it was a military outpost. There was no civilian population at Jericho. And so what do you have about Joshua going in and killing and wiping everyone out? Well, the same thing you have with the other stories of Joshua going and fighting places. What would have actually happened is Joshua goes out, fights the military targets, and once everyone, these are called disabling raids by scholars, once the military targets have been disabled, then, of course, Joshua dies. It says he's done everything the Lord has commanded him. Why? Because that's, all, that's what the Lord commanded him to do. That's what he meant by go up and do these things. And that's why I could say that Joshua's done. Even though it sounds like it's talking about extermination, you would describe those disabling raids as extermination using the literary devices of the time. How would you know? How would we know that it doesn't actually refer to complete annihilation? Again, very first chapter of the next book which says Joshua's dead, now how are we going to deal with the Canaanites? They would still have to deal with the normal Canaanite towns, not the military targets. Now, Shabir says that all this proves is that these books are contradicting each other. We're not talking about the books contradicting one another. We're talking about these, pass these, ver these passages being used side by side. One, it'll say, completely wipe them out, there's nothing left. And then in the same chapter or elsewhere in the same book, it will say, oh, yeah, and they're still there. Or God's going to drive them out, even though they've, they've been completely wiped out. Let me give you an example. In the book of Judges, right, first chapter. The men of Judah attacked Jerusalem and also took it. They put the city to the sword and set it on fire. So, no more Jerusalem, no more people in Jerusalem, right? Verse 21 of the same chapter. The, Benjamin, the Benjaminites, however, did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites live there with the Benjamite, ben, Benjaminites. So they took the city, wiped it all out. There's no one there. They burned it to the ground. Later, same chapter. But the Jebusites live there with them to this day. Can this be saying that they annihilated everyone? It can't be saying that. And if we go to the ancient texts of the Near East, we see this over and over and over again like a beating drum. Everyone does this. Now, that's about everything I detected as far as Shabir's response. So let me kind of put this together as far as differences in how we're interpreting these texts. Um, so what are the differences between how I'm interpreting these texts, how Shabir's interpreting these texts, violence in the Bible, violence in the Quran, and so on? Uh, one, violence in the Bible would be limited geographically. Keep in mind, you're talking about a little tiny piece of land here. In Islam, it's, it's a much greater area of fighting, and it's ongoing. And that's another difference. Uh, violence in the Bible is uh, limited temporally. Our final marching orders are love everyone, pray for those who persecute you, live in peace with everyone. You can't get fighting out of that unless you're obviously distorting it. Final marching orders. You can say there's violence. As we saw, this, uh, the Quran and the Bible both affirm the Old Testament. So we're both, we both have to deal with this. But the final marching orders of the Bible, what's the takeaway message? Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, honor everyone, live in peace with everyone, pursue peace with all men. What are the final marching orders of the Quran? Fight those who do not believe. Those who are with Muhammad are severe against disbelievers, uh, merciful among themselves. Very different takeaway message. And so the final difference here would be you can correct a Christian who decides to commit violence in the name of Jesus Christ, right? If someone says, hey, you know, I, was reading that, I was reading that story about Joshua, and I decide I'm going to go kill me some Canaanites. You can sit down and read the Bible beginning to end and accurately show him there are different covenants, and the covenant you are under, in the blood of Jesus Christ, that tells you the rules that you are supposed to follow as part of your covenant. There is an earlier covenant, old covenant, new covenant. There is a new covenant that you are under. It gives you specific commands. You have to follow those commands. The reverse is true of Islam. Yes, you can have tons of peaceful Muslims. I, most of the Muslims I've ever met in my life are peaceful. But if someone understands the Quran and decides, 929 is telling me to fight, you cannot accurately correct him because that is what the text is telling him to do. I always carry some books, right? Uh, and it's a good thing I still have my uh, microphone on. We ready? Okay. So uh, David says uh, he was using sarcasm, and if that's what you say, then I leave it between you and God. Uh, yesterday this came up. 
Yesterday this came up, and, and you didn't uh, uh, reply when I expressed my shock that you had said it. And uh, it seems now that the audience is willing to grant you that you have said this in sarcasm, and that left the opening for you to say that that's what you did, and, and God knows what, whatever is true. But uh, let's leave that point. Let's leave that point. He's saying that the, the, uh, the passage that I referred to from the Quran, Surah 9, verse 29, which he calls the final marching orders. Uh, first of all, what is the end point of that, of that passage? Suppose we take it that this means that Muslims should fight against Jews and Christians. It, it says, until they pay the tax, which is called the jizya in the Quran. So that means if people pay the tax, then they can live with Muslims. And historically, this has happened. Uh, Non-Muslims have lived under Muslim rule. Muslims understood this passage to mean this. We fight them until they pay the tax. If they pay the tax, they live and they are protected. They become protected citizens. We are responsible for protecting them. If anybody attacks, they don't have to join the army and fight, but we will fight on their behalf. So it's uh, give and take the tax, and we defend them. But he said that I am distorting the verse. Where in fact, he's distorting the verse because the verse says, fight those from among the people of the book who do not do this, 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 and this. So he picks one of the things, and he asks you, uh, do you subscribe to the religion of truth? You say no. So now it looks like Muslims are supposed to fight you according to that verse. But no, the verse is saying, fight those who do not meet any one of these four qualifications. That's what it literally says in the Arabic. So if he shows that you Christians meet, meet one of the qualifications, or three of the qualifications, that means still that verse does not apply to you. We only have to disprove that it applies to you by showing that you do not meet one of the qualifications. And I've shown that. Christians believe in God. That's one of the qualifications. So you believe in God, the verse does not apply to you. It's very uh, simple. That's literally what the text says. Now, it's, it's true that Muslims did not take it so literally. And they apply it to Jews and Christians more generally. Uh, but the fact that they have done so uh, does not mean that the Quran says so. And our question uh, in these two debates is, what does the Quran say and what does the Bible say? Is the Quran a book of peace? Is the Bible a book of peace? So we want to know what the book itself says, because if Muslims turn out to be violent, we can call them back to the Quran. We can say to the ISIS guys, look, you're not really following the Quran. You said you are, but you're distorting the book. But, but David really wants to say to the ISIS guys, you guys are right. And he wants to say to the moderate Muslims who uh, think we shouldn't be violent, we shouldn't attack anybody, he wants to say to the moderate Muslims like this, no, you're not really following your book. And I'm saying to the moderate Muslims, you are following the book. Because this book, this passage in particular, does not tell you to fight against uh, Jews and Christians uh, generally. Uh, what it says now has to now be uh, studied all over again, uh, because the, the way in which it has been presented to us in, in Muslim history has been itself distorted. Now he says, uh, well, well, it's uh, funny that Shabir is talking about just war, whereas the just war theory came out of the Bible. Actually, that's not true. Just war theory did not come out of the Bible, although uh, the saints that I mentioned did make reference to Romans 13. But Romans 13 uh, presents a problem for just war theory. Remember how David spoke about the brutality of the Romans and the gladiatorial games? I thought the Hunger Games were, was, uh, you know, were, were um, violent. But uh, the gladiatorial games, and think about more uh, generally about what he said about the Romans and the way they crushed their enemies, generally. Now Romans 13 is actually praising uh, the Roman authorities and says that they're carrying the sword to act on behalf of God, whereas it is the same Romans who, uh, under whose ages, Jesus was crucified. So where is the justice in all of this? Jesus was unjustly crucified. He didn't claim what they claimed, what they said he was claiming, and, and they crucified him. Uh, so uh, that, that passage itself poses a problem for just war theory, but nevertheless, it's a good thing that Christian scholars did come up with just war theory. They didn't come up with just war theory because of the Bible. They came up with just war theory as a reasonable response to the fact that there are going to be wars, and they're asking us Christians, which war can we support? And, and they're coming up with good reasons, but those reasons are not coming straight out of the Bible. In fact, often in contradiction to the Bible, in contradiction to those passages which uh, uh, denote uh, genocide. Uh, David says, this legal system that I'm talking about, if I criticize the Bible, I'm cr indirectly criticizing the Quran, because the Quran says that God gave the land of Israel to Israel. The passage he quotes for that is Surah 5, verse number 32. Uh, just because God said to them, you must establish justice in the land, that means you own the land. Uh, that's a far cry from establish justice in the land for, to you own the land. 
But there is another passage in the Quran in the 17th chapter in which God commands the Israelites to live in the land, to dwell in the land. And the word there in Arabic is uskunu. And that word is uh, related to being in tranquility. So live peacefully in the land. Uh, in, in chapter 5 as well, the Quran tells the Israelites uh, to enter into the land in a submissive manner, not going in fighting. Uh, so it's the Bible that tells them that you should go, uh, go in and fight and kill everything that breathes. Uh, I think uh, it really uh, David is misrepresenting the Bible. So let me, let me look at some passages here. Deuteronomy chapter 13. If you hear that uh, people are worshipping another god in, in any of the lands that God has given the Israelites, what are the Israelites to do? You shall put the inhabitants of that city to the sword, placing the city and all that is in it, even its livestock, under the ban. Having heaped all of its spoils in the middle of its square, you should burn the city with all of its spoils as a whole burnt offering to the Lord your God. That, that's men, women, children, everything in the city, everything that breathes. You kill them all, you gather them in, into the midst of the city and burn them as a burnt offering to God as the Jews used to offer sacrifices by animals to God. This is like a burnt offering uh, to God. Specific numbers are, are given. In the book of Numbers, chapter 31, uh, Moses and his team go through the Moabite lands and then they kill so many that what's left behind are the virgins. How many virgins re remain? 32,000 virgins. So if you think of the moms and dads and brothers and sisters who were killed, we don't even know the entire number. So this is not just a literary device. Yes, the writers think themselves to be violent. They think they, they want to represent their heroes as being violent. And that's what they did. Now we're asking, why did the Quran represent the same heroes? Why didn't this kind of atrocity about Moses get reproduced in the Quran? Suppose Muhammad was a violent individual and he's composing the Quran. Uh, and he wants to be violent himself. Why doesn't he show that the role models of the past were as violent as he wants to be? Why is he showing them to be so peaceful in the Quran, whereas they're known to be violent elsewhere? He is giving a different picture. He's turning the attitude of the believers towards a new direction, towards peace and away from violence. Am I the only one saying that because I don't understand the Bible? Peace and Violence in the New Testament by Michel Desjardins. Uh, Michel uh, traces all of the passages in the New Testament in particular, Peace and Violence and the New Testament. I'm sorry, that's the title of the book, Peace and Violence and the New Testament. So she, she shows that Jesus is represented two ways. One, very peaceful. One, violent. And she says that uh, finally there's no good resolution for that, but it does make it very uncomfortable for her reading and seeing that this is how Jesus is represented in the two ways. I'm saying the two ways are there, and Christians pick the peaceful way, but there's also a violent strain. Thank you. All right, well, all of this is coming together for a, a good summation. Uh, Shabir pointed out accurately that uh, Jews and Christians do, at the end of Surah 9, verse 29, have the option of paying the jizya, in which case we won't... Uh, we won't be killed. This is an advantage we have over uh, people who don't have uh, uh, scriptures from God, like the pagans. Um, but this is meant to be a humiliation. For, as far as Muhammad's comment on jizya, um, Sahih al-Bukhari, as the introduction of chapter, uh, chapter 88, the prophet said, My livelihood is under the shade of my spear, and he who disobeys my orders will be humiliated by paying jizya. So jizya is a sign of humiliation. That's why it says, uh, feel themselves subdued. You're supposed to feel, feel like you are a second-class person. Uh, by the way, the very next verse, as we saw yesterday, is chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran, which gives the justification. And the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. This isn't just saying believe, you know, if you believe in God in any sense. This is talking about you have to believe what, you have to believe in Allah. You believe what Allah uh, you, what, what the Quran says about Allah. You have to believe in what Islam teaches about the last day. Uh, as far as uh, proof of this, chapter 9, verse 30, the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah. The Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieve before. Allah's curse be upon them, however they are turned away. This is the justification for fighting us in the previous verse. Don't go with me. Here's Ibn Kathir on this. He says, fighting Jews and Christians is legislated because they are idolaters and disbelievers. Allah encourages the believers to fight the disbelieving Jews and Christians who uttered this terrible statement and lies against Allah. So that's the justification there. 
Shabir, now to turning to the Bible, he says that uh, Romans 13 is praising Roman authorities and presents a problem for just war theory. So just war theory doesn't uh, arise from the Bible. That's completely false. Romans 13 is written by Paul where he tells us that, uh, that rulers are given authority by God to punish wrongdoers and so on, and that we have, to, we have to submit to them. That in no way conflicts with obligations for rulers. We see this from the Apostle Paul himself in the book of Acts chapter 25 when the Roman governor wants to hand him over. And Paul says, if I've done something worthy of death, I do not hesitate to die. But if I haven't, no one has the right to hand me over to them. He's talking to the Roman governor. I thought according to Shabir, Paul believed you just, you know, do whatever the, go do whatever the government said. What is this? You have just war theory right there. Yes, you, government, you have authority. But you also have obligations to do the right thing. Put those together. That's where you get it. Now, Shabir um, cites uh, Numbers 31 as a last example. I'm running out of time here, so I don't get to respond to everything. But uh, Romans, Numbers 31 is another perfect example. The Midianites. The Midianites are completely wiped out, except for the women who didn't try to lead Israel astray by uh, taking Balaam's offer of seducing the Israelites away and convincing them to, uh, to worship other gods. Those women were uh, brought into Israel. So there, there's no more Midianites, right? According, if we go with a literal interpretation of the text, no hyperbole, no hyperbolic uh, rhetoric or anything, straightforward interpretation, there are no more Midianites. And yet we read just a little later here in the book of Judges, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. What Midianites? They're all gone, right? Because, of the power of, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. The Israelites are hiding because there's so many Midianites. How could it be any more clear? Every example we're given of complete annihilation and complete extermination, all the groups that are supposedly exterminated are around later, and the passages are used interchangeably with driving them out and things like that. And so you'd have to say that something is going on with the text here, and it obviously is, and scholars know what it is because they have other ancient texts. And so uh, Shabir says the Quran tells Jews to live in the land uh, peacefully. That doesn't change the fact that in 532 they're told they get to carry out Jewish law, Jewish penalties in that land. And so if this is, if this is a problem for the Bible, this would be a problem for the Quran. And so have we seen any reason, any reason to think that the Bible is not a book of peace. Again, is there, is there violence in the Old Testament? Is there invasion of the land and so on? Yes, keep in mind uh, what, what these people were doing. Their, their, their practices were uh, child sacrifice and bestiality and so on. And God kept his people in Egypt for four centuries because he would not allow them to take the land until they were so incredibly sinful that he would put an end to it. And what did he do then? He had them fight their militaries and drive them out. So even here, in the most, in the most violent passages you have, it's certainly not as bad as uh, Shabir makes it out to be, but then when we consider the final marching orders, love your neighbors yourself, pray for those who persecute you, live in peace with everyone, there's no way we can say with a straight face that the Bible is not a book of peace. And my microphone is still uh, turned on. <laughs> Ready to go, John? Okay, I have to turn it off unless it, uh, we lose battery here. Okay. So finally, folks, I'm glad that we've come now to uh, put our final thoughts together on what has transpired uh, over the last two nights. I started out by giving common criteria by which to evaluate the two books. And to my uh, estimation, David has not given common criteria. He has attacked the Quran uh, from one angle, and he has supported the Bible uh, from a different uh, angle. So uh, we need common criteria. You cannot uh, attack the Quran for something that is there in the Bible or even worse in the Bible. We have genocide in the Bible. It's not there in the Quran. He says it's not really genocide. It's just a literary device. But in fact, the passages are very clear. Well, I've read to you a passage or, or, or one or more passages from the Bible which show that God is really clearly commanding this genocide. Now, did God actually command those genocide? I don't believe so. Uh, did, does the Quran say that God commanded that genocide? No way. So the Quran is not contradicting itself. When the Quran is saying that the Jews had the, the right to practice the revelations from God and the instructions that came from him to uh, enact justice on the land, so that does not contradict, uh, God does not contradict himself by doing so. He's telling them to do the right thing. Uh, if later on their books are composed and then they do something that is wrong in the land, then this is uh, their distortion of the message from God, and the Quran is not uh, responsible uh, for that. Uh, as for the uh, Midianites, uh, it's, it's very clear. So many are killed and, and the rest are saved. We know the, the number of those who are saved. It's not a literary device. Clearly, that there is uh, uh, some 
um, problem there. There is a genocide, large amounts of people being killed. So when we look at the Quran then, we see that I have uh, delineated my um, classifications and, and my uh, conditions for determining whether a book is a book of uh, uh, peace or not. And I've said, the first thing is, how do you represent your heroes? And uh, we have seen that many heroes of the Bible are represented, misrepresented, I would say, as people who enacted genocide and ethnic cleansing. The Quran actually gives a different picture of those heroes and presents them as pictures of peace. Second, is there a passage which actually commands uh, us to enter into peace? And uh, David has cited uh, Hebrews, and I agree that Many passages of the Bible teach us to live in peace. The Quran as well, I said, Surah 2, verse number 208, tells Muslims to enter into peace categorically. David disputed my uh, translation of that passage. He said he's not familiar with any of the ancient commentaries that uh, say that, but I've actually cited two. I've cited as the judge uh, who said this, and uh, I've cited uh, uh, Al-Qurtubi, who said that it literally means that, but we can't accept that. Basically, that's what he said, uh, in essence. So that's what, what I've been saying all along. Muslim commentators have not accepted the message of the Quran, pure and simple as it was. They have turned the Quran into a violent book through their misinterpretations. Even though they were good and great scholars, but they were subject to their time and place and environment, just like I'm subject to my time and place and environment. What, what leads me to go back and research all of these things? Because of my time and place and environment and certain circumstances and research material that is available to me now. I have uh, a stick here which I've just plugged into my computer, giving me access to 12,500 uh, ancient Arabic books. So uh, we, we have tools, we have different uh, circumstances and so on, so we can go back and re-examine certain things. So the Quran does actually commit, uh, command people to live in peace. The third thing, does it have a legal system? Uh, I think the Bible really fails on this point because especially the New Testament, David said the legal system is left to others because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So the, this world is left to somebody else to run according to their own devices, the Romans especially, with the gladi gladiatorial games. That's going to be justice in, in the land. And then the last point I said uh, is that, uh, uh, does it have... Uh, uh, a legal system and does uh, the just war theory. I said that everything in the Quran falls within just war theory. Even when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went into war, he went as a legitimate uh, authority. This is where ISIS and others f fail. This is where the young man living in this great city takes it upon himself. He's not a leg legitimate authority. He cannot think we Muslims are at war with America and I'm going to go attack some installation or some Marines or something like that. He's just not a legitimate and proper authority. He fails on the first point. Whereas it is clear in the Quran that Muslims are to obey their authorities. But ulil amri minkum, the Quran says. And uh, we have to obey whatever authorities uh, are, are above us. And in fact, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, only went to war when he was a legitimate authority and when he had the responsibility to protect his citizens and to protect the oppressed people. So he was following actually just war theory. Whereas in fact when we look at the Bible we see that this does not fall into just war theory because we have genocide and ethnic cleansing not on one occasion but on several uh, occasions. Maybe this is a, did not happen historically. It's not really true. But the Bible is celebrating it as though it is true and therefore the Bible fails on this point. Thank you.